Hello, welcome to Mid-Atlantic's Machinery's very first Thirsty for Knowledge Thursday. I'm Dave Friday with Mid-Atlantic Machinery, uh, regional manager, been with them for about 20 years. And with me is Josh Mays, our robotic expert. And today we'll be talking about our collaborative robot connected and integrated to a Trump press break. Uh, Josh, well, we're socially distanced here. I think we can take these masks off. Yeah. My glasses keep fogging up. <laughs> so, Josh, what, what is a collaborative robot? A collaborative robot, Dave, is a um, force and torque limited robot. Um, the robots of the past would continue to hit you and just go right through you. Um, this robot will actually bump into you, and if it sees that there's something in its way that it doesn't expect, it stops. So that allows us to put these robots out in um, applications out on a shop floor without the caging and all that stuff yeah. around them. Right. Most robots I see out in the field have these big cages around them, and they take up a very large footprint. So this one, because of its safety features, no cages are, are needed or anything like that. Exactly. Now, it is important to note um, with the press brake package, we do provide um, a safety scanner with this because of the speeds and the sharp metal we're moving. That that makes sense. We put some um, extra protection into place. Okay. Okay. So we're a certified system integrator for UR robots. What exactly is, is that? So Universal Robot um, has a different strategy to go to market where they go out and they basically provide the robot through a distribution channel. The certified system integrator um, takes the robot and develops the solution for the problem. So Universal Robots provides the robot, which is a very useful, powerful tool. And then what we do is we integrate that robot, allow it to communicate with other machines, and give it the ability to be a turnkey system. Oh, great. So I've noticed over the past year you've kind of been working on this setup here with the uh, Trump 7036 press brake, a uh, small 40-ton, 40 40-inch 40 press brake. Um, and you got some neat designs here, and it looks like it's on a little cart. Um, can, can you kind of explain the system and what exactly is going on here? And, and maybe we can, can we, act, can we actually run it today for, and show our, our audience? Sure, let me get up here. Great. Stay away a little bit. So <clears throat> the ur 10 -E collaborative robot bending system um, basically starts with the universal robot. The universal robot, like I said, is a very easy to use, easy to program tool. Um, what we've done is we've developed methods for this robot to be able to hold a wide variety of parts, and we've also given it the ability to communicate with the 7036 press brake. Um, talk a little bit more about how we um, communicate to the press brake is, you can see a box on the floor over there, excuse me for not having it up here where I can point to it, but uh, we have one quick disconnect cord set that allows the robot to hook up to the press brake and unhook from the press brake very quickly and easily. You only need 110 volts and an airline. Um, when you're not using this robot on your press brake on first shift, we can move it out of the way and put it on another piece of machinery. So Josh, what voltage does it run over? If, if I want to move it around the shop, do I have to have 220, 440, 110 volt on there? How easy is it to, to change the electrics on it? I actually have one of these in my office at the house that I do programming with. It's a 110 volt setup. It's one of the largest benefits of the collaborative robot is you don't need a certified electrician to run three phase power, um, plug and go. Uh, that's great. That makes it easy to move it around if we want to move it onto a, a deburring machine or something like that. And it's on a, what, a mobile cart here that can be moved and disconnected from the brake pretty easily? Yes, yeah, so what we have here is a uh, heavy duty mobile cart and it actually has self leveling casters or leveling casters on it that will bring the wheels up off of the ground. So if you want to run your finishing machine or something like that uh, where you don't have to have the robot pinned in place necessarily or very accurately placed, we can get the whole cart up off of the floor. Oh, great. Now could they um, disconnect it from the press brake and run the press brake in a, in a manual mode for those short run type jobs, things like that? Yes, and that's uh, very important to note. On our press brake setup, I'm going to come back here by the brake. 
is that the vision system, you can see the lights on it, are active. Um, so we are always protecting the tooling zone, even when the robot is running the brake. Perfect, perfect. So can we run the robot now? Show yeah. them how, to, how it works? Sure, let's get a little demo going right. on here. Perfect. Dave, so to bend apart, uh, we bring the robot onto the press brake like we talked about a little bit earlier. We use the quick disconnect cord sets to get it integrated to the brake press, boot everything up, load a program. At that point, I usually come over to the press brake and for this part, we are going to be bending a part from the channel family. Okay. It's just gonna be a simple part with a bend on each side. See a part like that every day in a shop. Exactly. So that's kind of where we like to start is with the simpler parts, get the customer, you know, comfortable with the robotics and the process, and then we can continue to add complexity later. All right. So first part, I'm going to put it in here, put a bend on it, um, check my angle. I don't have my protractor. That's a pretty good looking 90 degree. So we're gonna come over here and we're gonna put our next bend on. Once again, we'd do the same thing. We'd check our part, measure it, put our corrections, which are already in here, at a degree and a half, and the press brake is now set up and ready to run. So typical setup for any press brake operator. Um, if it's already a program part, I'd say in 15 minutes, you should be able to run that program on a brake from the first time on. And the first time on to the brake's gonna take a little longer than you know the second, third part. Right, right. So now we're going to go ahead and load the robot program up. And hit play. Forgot to put our box over here to catch the parts, Dave. So typically, yeah, when it's you're... a critical part of the job. Come on, Josh. <laughs> typically, when we're bending, um, we like to use boxes, conveyors, anything like that to go ahead and put the parts into. And we're using force moves here, which we'll talk about a little bit more to find the back gauges. Could you also stack the finished part on a uh, pallet or or? the cart or something like that? Yeah, so we do have the ability to palletize and put things on conveyors, stack them, have them auto index. It all depends on how long you want to run the system. Um, if you're going to have somebody there on second shift that can do it, you know, it's basically four hours of production. You needed a given amount of area to stack parts. If you wanted to run eight or 12, we could add conveyors. And right. the beautiful thing about the universal robots, how adaptive and open of a control system it has. Um, later on in the process, we can add automated inspection to where we could have the robot dropping the part on something vision and then have the robot make a decision whether that's a good part or a bad part and you know really get to the point to where the robot could be stacking parts for shipment to the end user. Right. Okay, that'd, that'd be good. So if there's got 500 parts or something like that, they can stack them up, drop them in a box, get them ready to go out to the next operation or, or to the customer. Yes, and yeah. you know, another thing I think we should talk about here is uh, UR does a very nice job providing what I would call a palletizing template. So if we wanted to fill this table with parts, we would teach it a position here, position here, and a position here, give it the spacing, and the robot will generate the program itself with the layers. Okay, so they can kind of stack and it knows that it's getting higher and higher each time. Yep, yep, and it can even um, stop and ask the operator to interlace paper between layers and things like that. Wow. So we can really customize it to whatever you want that robot so can, to do. That must do what the operator is doing. Pretty much. Okay. So I know in talking to in, or working with robotics and things like that in the past, the end of arm tooling or the gripper is a major component of the, the whole system. How do you determine and design the gripper uh, for all the different parts that you might come across? So that's a good question. I'll bring the robot over here so we can show a little better what we got going on. 
So gripping of a part is something that was one of the most challenging obstacles to overcome in developing of this system. But what we've come up with is a patent pending gripping system that is quick change. I have different heads that if they need to be changed for parts, I take four bolts out here and I can change a couple dis quick disconnect fittings and have my next gripper on. What this allows us to do is to very quickly and easily go from part to part. As we were developing the gripping system, there was a need to turn a lot of parts. As you saw in the video, this gripper actually has the ability to rotate the part 180 degrees. When we rotate the part 180 degrees, that allows the robot not to have to sit the part back down go over and regrip it. So you don't have to do the reposition stop. Exactly. Yeah. So what I get the customer then is more parts per hour or more revenue, which okay. is what we're all after. And that looks like that can be expanded for, for larger parts. Um, and I understand the, the weight limit on this is 22 pounds, but uh, you can do some larger parts based on the press brake that you have. Yes, so we do have a quick change tooling plate on this rotary where we take two bolts out and the whole head will change out. And then we just change the length of this bar in the back to change the distance between the gripping fingers. What this allows us to do is without changing parts over off of the robot at all, is the goal is to try and cover as many parts as we can with one gripper. That way, um, you know, through intelligent design and engineering, we've been able to come up with a change system so you can adapt and do quick change and it becomes a very versatile gripping system where we can pick up um, lots of different parts with one gripper. Now you don't have to pay to engineer an end effector for every part which is one of the most cumbersome things. So that's very viable to a job shop who never knows what they're getting in from one day to the next that they can change the size of that gripper to grip all the different parts that they may get. Exactly. So what we provide is a kit to where, you know, we will design the gripper to work for the parts you need it to. But when you need to add new parts, you're not tied into only using one gripper. You can change the length of these bars. We have uh, suction cups that change and quick tool plates for this. So, you know, we have a lot of different ways to get a hold of that part and really manipulate it. That looks very clean. I, you know, there are no hoses out here or anything like that. They're kept back away from the part. How are those made? Um, so we actually developed these here at Mid-Atlantic Machinery, and I'm going to take you over here to one of my favorite uh, tools, our 3D printer. So over the past two and a half years, we've been um, very successful with additive manufacturing. Um, additive manufacturing gives us the ability to not only design your gripper, but to build this gripper in-house. Um, Basically, anything that we can draw, we can print in a carbon fiber nylon that's uh, very strong. So we have the ability to not only do the design work, we have the ability to supply the components as they're needed. Perfect, perfect. So if they have this in for a year or so and they got some really strange part that this current gripper doesn't work, we could design one relatively quickly and, and print one up for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. So the other question I get a lot from, from my customers is the programming the robot. How hard is it? How difficult is it? How long does it take for each part to be programmed? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. So we played around a little bit this morning um, with some of our uh, newest team members, Dallas, and had a little bit of fun with the robot. And in a couple of minutes, he was able to generate this program we thought this is just a good opportunity to have a little fun with the robot and show you how useful the uh, force moves can be for fun programs or for finding the back gauges on your press brake. Go ahead and start the program here. Move the robot to the home position and hit play. Fist bump him, fist bump him, fist bump him. Give me five, Bender. Josh, we talked about using it on other pieces of equipment like a deburring center, things like that. Um, how about on a machining center? Uh, I know you did one for me, one of my customers, pretty uh, elaborate system on uh, loading a machining center. 
with a lot of different components. You want to tell the audience about that? Yeah, so um, the robots are excellent for machine tool tending as well, and that's actually one of the first places they found their home is um, mills, lathes, CNC equipment like that. The one we did, um, we had a customer that had heavy castings, and it was a four position operation on a Mazak pallet changer. And these parts were big and, you know, the guys just were having trouble leaning over the uh, table and doing the work. So we um, engineered a system with them and the robot has three end of arm tools. It has the ability to pick the casting up, it has an air knife, and it has a laser distance transducer. So this Mazak machine has two pallet changers that come in and out. The robot is sitting waiting above the pallet and it knows whenever the states change on the pallets. And at that point, it goes into its program whenever the pallets trigger it. The first thing the robot does is comes out and it blows all the chips and coolant off of all the fixtures and the parts. Um, then we unclamp the parts. We go grab the first one and basically unload it. It's a finished part. Then we come back and we blow all the chips and the coolant off of that fixture. We move the next part to that station and so on throughout the yeah. entire power. So it's doing more than just loading and unloading. It's actually blowing chips off, laser scanning to make sure the part's in the right place, uh, and then also doing a reposition of a part, correct? Exactly. Yeah. It does flip the part at one point. There's a station overhead where the casting needs rolled over for a machine operation on the other side. And, um, you know, we're not just open looping that this thing's ready. We're physically, after we clamp with the robot, we're going over and we're measuring to the top of the casting. That way we have closed loop feedback knowing that the machine is properly loaded and we're going to make a good yeah. part. Well, just to let you know, that's been running for about a year. My customer has been very happy with that system. And I don't think you've even gotten a call from them in the past year or so. It's been running so well. No, that's yeah. great to hear. Yeah. Yep, perfect. So what do you see for future applications for the robot um, or maybe expanding it uh, beyond press breaks? I think finishing equipment is ready today. I think, you know, you could open loop, um, meaning that the robot's just sitting down and there's no verification that the yeah. part's being placed there. I think there's lots of applications that are ready for that today and, you know, that's where I'd be using my robot. If I'm not using it on first shift, put it on my finish line deburring machine, yeah. put it on my um, inspection equipment or anything like that. And I continue to see us um, developing standard packages for um, saws, iron workers, oh. anything you can imagine um, in the fabrication world and the interface module that we've engineered and designed here can work with many different machine tools. The idea behind that being that you have the same cord set plugging in, we can now use the same robot and integrate it into yeah. multiple different yeah. machines. Yeah, and even in today's economy, it's amazing that um, my customers are still having a hard time finding skilled laborers for machine operation or, or welding. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, I don't have any more questions for you. Hopefully everyone enjoyed uh, our first Thirsty Thursday. If and anybody's got any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, love talking automation, love talking shop, and hopefully we can help you with your application. Again, thanks for tuning in to our very first Thirsty for Knowledge Thursday. Uh, we will be running these the last Thursday of each month on different fabricating equipment here at Mid-Atlantic Machinery. Thanks again. You know, this won't work unless you have a good guy. Here. <laughs> what are you doing on the set? Oh, my. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Quiet on the set, please. <laughs>